Well, in 1915, uh, a Harvard social scientist named Walter Cannon created a theory called acute stress response, where he posited that when humans are under pressure, when humans are in tension or in conflict, that they resort to one of two options for responding to conflict, responding to pressure, responding to tension. And those two options are fight or flight. He suggested that human beings have a a, a way of responding in seasons and moments of conflict that we either fight, we kind of power up, we push back, we fight either physically or verbally, or we either fight or we take flight, we withdraw. We retract, we step back and try to avoid things altogether. In his research, he said that there are only and always two possible responses, fight or flight. This morning, we're going to see that Jesus offers a third. Regardless of what Harvard research shows, Jesus offers a third way, and we're going to see in our text today that Jesus will teach us and show us what he later modeled for us on the cross, that there is a third way of responding in the midst of conflict. Now, we've been dragging our feet all summer long through the most famous sermon ever given, the most famous sermon of, in any religion is what we've spent all summer long digging into because it's not just a sermon. It's essentially Jesus' manifesto, his, his way of uh, addressing and describing this depiction of what the Christian life looks like. And Jesus, up to this point, has been uber practical for us, at times even uncomfortable. Not like uncomfortable in a sense that Uh, Jesus is saying some kind of sketchy and sus things. No, uncomfortable in a sense that Jesus is actually addressing some things that we're really actually dealing with as humans. Not just some like hypothetical, uh, worst case scenario, sinner options here. Like, hey, don't do these crazy things spiritually and you should be fit. No, Jesus Jesus has given us some real talk, some real life and very practical things as he walks us through the Sermon on the Mount. Now, over the course of the last several weeks, we've hit on four of six of these antitheses, these these statements that have kind of shifted culture, upended things for us, where Jesus starts by saying, you've heard it said, and then he quotes an Old Testament law. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus says, that life in my kingdom, living like me, your Messiah, the the Christ, looks different. I'm here to tell you, and then he drills down and he drills deep and he goes under the surface and he doesn't just take hedge trimmers, he takes chainsaws. He's going deep into what actually motivates us and fuels us and drives us, this human behavior from the surface level is not what Jesus is after. No, Jesus wants to drill deep into what drives us as humans. And so these last two antitheses that Jesus is going to walk through of of six total deal with conflict and tension, which means like we we can just probably skip over this, right? Nobody deals with any conflict in, in your family, There's probably not any conflict in your marriage. There's probably not any conflict with your kids or your spouse at your work in your neighborhood, let alone there's not any conflict whatsoever in our culture today, right? Wrong. Which means what Jesus has to say to us this morning, critically important. But before we lock in, I I, want to, I've just got to say that this is probably the most misunderstood and misused parts of the Sermon on the Mount, possibly the most misunderstood and misused portions of all of the New Testament. It has been misused, misapplied, misunderstood, and it's been leveraged to justify abuse and violence and oppression of uh, the, the most vulnerable and the less powerful in all of society, which if you know the character of Christ, 
You know that to leverage scripture for, for, for power and abuse and taking advantage of the less vulnerable could not be further from who Jesus is in his character. And so Jesus is, he's kind of getting toward the middle of this Sermon on the Mount. It says this in verse 38. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now Jesus here in this as he's quoting back to the Old Testament law, he's actually quoting from three different texts from the Old Testament. Exodus 21, Leviticus 24, and Deuteronomy 19. He's quoting from this this cultural ancient law that in Latin uh, is known as the lex talionis. It's the law of retaliation. And, And the law in the ancient world was established as a guide to retribution that said that the punishment should be appropriate to the proportion of the crime. The punishment ought to fit the crime. And so if somebody steals a loaf of bread from you, it would be inappropriate to go burn their house to the ground and murder their family, right? Doesn't quite fit, the punishment doesn't quite fit the crime. Now, scholars would agree that this lex talionis probably wasn't meant to be applied to every single case in every single crime. It was more of a graphic metaphor, established an equivalence of loss and a guide for justice in that day. But Jesus is going to give us a handful of examples. And like he does throughout the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to kind of weave in this story so that we can understand as Christians with great clarity and great confidence what it looks like for Christians to deal with conflict. Now, this is how Jesus says it. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, Jesus, in my kingdom, my ethic that I'm, that I'm putting forward is that you should, uh, but I say to you, don't resist the one who's evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. What's interesting is that in each of these circumstances and in each of these cases, the Christian is the one who's in a position with less power. Jesus is not addressing government or or military action here. What he's unpacking for us is the unique way that Christians should respond when mistreated or disrespective. In a way, Jesus is walking us through this ethic of peaceful compliance that asserts one's equity. Now, keep in mind that these were a people who were living under Roman occupation. They were living in this first century under the Roman oppression, and it was not uncommon in those days for a person of a Jewish faith in the civilians under Roman occupation, for a Roman soldier to show up at your door with swords drawn and body armor on. They would often just kick down the door of any civilian around, and they would plunder everything and anything that they wanted. The Romans were known for abducting children and abusing and beating family members, and they would laugh all while they were doing it, while you sat and wept in terror. To add insult to injury, uh, the Roman Empire was known for taxing you just to live in your own space, to live in your own home. So how do you think people felt about a Roman occupation in that day? Not great. They were literally hoping that the Messiah would come, liberate them, give them freedom, and then come in with some military might and power. But watch what Jesus says in verse 39. But I say to you, don't resist the one who's evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other Also, Now, Jesus is very specific here. Notice he doesn't say, in general, if somebody slaps you, just give them whatever cheek that they didn't hit you on. No, Jesus says, if someone slaps you on the right cheek. Now, in the first century uh, Jewish culture, the left hand was considered unclean. Spare me into going into all of the details here, but suffice it to say, there was no, in the first century, there was no Charmin Ultra. Okay, there was no single ply. There was no double ply. There was no quilted quicker pick. Y'all smell what I'm stepping in? You picking up what I'm putting down? 
Everybody clear on this? So the left hand in the first century was universally understood as being unclean. The right hand, on the other hand, see, see what I did there? That was funny. As I was talking about the left hand on the other hand, the right, the right hand on the other hand was used for work. It was used for all of the interacting, all of the, anytime you would use your hands for something to shake another person's hand, you would use the right hand. And so if someone in the first century is getting slapped on the right cheek and the left hand isn't being used, what does this imply? It, it, it implies that this is a backhanded slap. So this slap is less about violence and more about disrespect. It's this backhanded slap that in the moment, what's our response? Harvard would say you either fight or you take flight. You hit back or you run away in embarrassment. But Jesus offers a third way. And it's this third option of grace and not backing down and reclaiming humanity. N.T. Wright, New Testament scholar and theologian, uh, offers this insight on the text. He writes, what's the answer? How, how do we answer here? If somebody slaps you, if somebody backhands you, what should we do, Jesus? Hitting back only keeps the evil in circulation. Offering the other cheek implies, hit me again if you like, but now as an equal, not an inferior. Turning the other cheek is not cowering. It's standing up and standing in the presence of oppression and refusing to be defined by the oppressor. It's not an act of shame, it's an act of dignity. What Jesus isn't saying here is, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, I just let him hit you again. No, this is not what Jesus is talking about. But Jesus goes on. He starts with the story and an example of abuse, and then he shifts gears here in verse 40. And he says, if anyone would sue you, and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. So Jesus now starts to talk about a legal issue. He goes from abuse to a lawsuit, a debt situation. Now, a, a little bit of context here. The Roman Empire was so abusive in their power and caused the already poor in their empire to give up even the very little that they had. Uh, typically in this first century culture, people had two items of clothing. There was the tunic, which was kind of worn close to the body. Think about it as an undershirt, maybe like a tank top, maybe like a short sleeve shirt. The tunic was what you wore close to your body. It's like a first century version of um, Spanx, okay? So you got your first century Spanx on as your tunic, and then you've got a cloak, which is kind of like a robe or a coat. It was used oftentimes to keep warm during the day in the cool months and to keep warm at night. Now, under Mosaic law... You couldn't legally take someone's cloak away from them. It was just first century provision for making sure that people were able to stay warm and covered. So Jesus is talking about this hypothetical situation. Let's say someone is suing you, and the only thing you have left, the only thing you have left to your name is your tunic. It's your undershirt. And so the law was you've got you to give them that because that's all you have left. And Jesus says, while you're at it, give them your jacket too, which legally you don't, you don't even have to give up, which begs the question, if this is all you've got, what does this leave you with clothing-wise? Nothing. Socks and a smile. You're in your birthday suit here in the courtroom in front of God and everyone completely naked. And so what's happening in this moment? Fight or flight. You're being sued. You've got nothing left. And Jesus says, oh, neither. Neither fight nor flight. The tables have been turned now. And the plaintiff has now caused nakedness and shame, which is absurd, right? The oppressor has pushed it too far and shamed the oppressed. Now, Jesus is teaching this in a time and culture when there were two ways to identify someone's ethnicity, by the clothes that they wore and the accent that they had. Think about another time that Jesus was teaching something similar to this, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. This is the story of this person who, has been, who is on the side of the road, who has been stripped 
and left for dead. In two words, stripped, he's got no clothes on, left for dead, and this person is unconscious. In two words, Jesus has spoken about this person and removed any ability to determine what ethnic background this person belonged to. Everybody's listening to Jesus tell the story of the Good Samaritan, wondering, uh, okay, tell us, is this person, is this person on the side of the road, are they on our side? Are they on our team? Or are, they, are they on the opposition? Are, are they part of our ethnic group? Or are they part of some other ethnic group? But Jesus reduces the story of the Good Samaritan, just like he does in the story of the Sermon on the Mount. He reduces the story to the dignity of a human being. He boils it all down to reduce this to a question, not of ethnicity, but of humanity. And he highlights human dignity and the value of the Imago Dei, the image of God. And the image of God tells us this, that every single person ever born was made in the image of God. Regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of the number in their bank account, regardless of any choices they're making, the country of origin or the, pol- the political party they're registered as. Translation for us, we as Christians ought to be the people who love every single person no matter what. Maybe this guy who's suing this other person has these clothes thrown at him. Oh, you want to take my tunic? Here's the cloak too. Maybe the one who's suing would see this person's humanity and feel embarrassed, like, what am I, I've taken everything, what am I doing? Am I taking the very last thing from this human being that he's just standing here vulnerable? Time and time again, all throughout scripture, teachings of Jesus powerfully reveal the inherent value and dignity of human beings. Jesus is not done. He goes on in verse 41. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Now, military law in that day, in the first century, made it permissible for a soldier to get a civilian at any time and force this civilian to carry his pack, his weapons, for a mile. Now, in this day, a Roman Roman military pack would have weighed about 85 pounds, But the law limited this request to one mile. If a Roman soldier had a civilian carry his pack more than a mile, the soldier was in violation of the military code. And military code was upheld higher and stronger than civilian code. And so Jesus says, next time a soldier forces you to carry his pack, cooperate, carry it. Carry it to the first mile and then carry it for him a second mile. Now, a Roman soldier could, at any point in the day, interrupt any work that somebody was doing, any play, any family time, and force the civilian to comply, which, as you can imagine, led to so many in that culture just begrudgingly picking up the pack and start walking. And you can imagine they're probably muttering and complaining until they get to that mile marker. But in this situation, in the story that Jesus is telling, the power dynamic shifts. This person who walks a mile now keeps going for a second mile. Can't you imagine that the Roman soldier's like, hey, this is in violation of military code. My commanding officer's gonna be so upset. This is not gonna go well. This will not end well. What are you doing? But yet in all three of these instances, Jesus is teaching the oppressed how to take the power back from the oppressor in surprising and unexpected moves of peaceful defiance that actually restores dignity to the point that Jesus is reminding us today. He's reminding you, you were created in the image of God. You are not a doormat. You may have felt like a doormat at some point in your life where you were taken advantage of, where you were abused, where someone uh, took advantage of your kindness and your generosity. But Jesus reminds us all, every person in this room, every person watching online, everyone in our community and on planet earth, you're created in the image of God and you're not a doormat. This is the upending that Jesus is doing 
in giving us a third choice? Is it fight? Is that the way we respond as Christians in conflict? Or is it flight? Do we just kind of walk away and act like it never happened? Jesus gives us a third choice, a choice that restores dignity through peace. There's a story of a social worker in the Bronx in New York by the name of Julio Diaz. He's about 30 years old and lives in the Bronx. And every, every morning he gets on the subway and takes an hour commute to his job. When he finishes work, he takes an hour commute home, but on his way home, he always stops one stop short of his home stop. And he does this so that he can eat at his favorite restaurant, this local diner in just outside of his community. And he tells the story that several years ago, and this is a true story, several years ago, he gets off of the subway at the stop where his diner is, just like he does every night. And it was an almost empty subway station. But as he gets off to go to dinner, this teenage boy jumps out and holds a knife to him and says, give me your wallet. So Julio pulls out his wallet and gives it to this teenage boy who was robbing him. And he says, hey, before you go, hey, you forgot something. And Julio begins to take off his jacket and says, if you're going to be robbing people for the rest of the night, you might as well take my coat and stay warm while you're doing it. So this teenager in, in response is questioning, what are, you, what are you doing? So Julio, the social worker, tells him, well, if you're going to risk your freedom for a few dollars, then I guess you must really need the money. I mean, all I wanted to do is get dinner and then go home after work. But you can join me for dinner if you want. And this teenage robber looked at him and said, okay, I'll go to dinner with you. So they go to Julio's favorite diner, and as they're eating there, the teenager who robbed him said, do you, do you own this place? And he said, no, it's just my favorite place to go and eat. He says, well, you're, you're nice to everybody. And Julio asks him, well, isn't that what you were taught? And the kid replies, yeah, that, it's what I was taught, but I just didn't think anybody actually did that. And so they enjoy a meal together, and Julio asks this teenager, what do you want out of life? And he says, I don't know. The bill comes, and Julio looks at this kid who's robbed him and said, look, I guess you're going to have to pay for this because you've got my wallet, and <laughs> I can't pay for it. But if you give me my wallet back, I'll buy your dinner. So the teenager gave him his wallet back, and Julio paid for the meal and gave him tw $20 and said, I, I just have one thing to ask of you. The kid's like, sure. He says, give me Give me your knife back. Julio chose this third way, this Jesus way, not, not fight or flight. And isn't this just like Jesus? Julio could have pressed charges against this kid. He could have fought back. He could have run from this teenager in fear. But instead, Julio saw the third choice, not fight, not flight, but the Jesus way. Jesus wraps up the story in this way in verse 42. Give to the one who begs from you. And don't refuse the one who would borrow from you. Jesus shares this vision of a radical new way of life that completely turns our perspective upside down. Is it fight? Is it flight? Or is it the Jesus way? When conflict comes in your life, when the pressure is consuming and overwhelming, when things don't go the way that you want, maybe you give someone more than they ask for. Maybe you inconvenience yourself in a way that disrupts the conflict. Because you can only have conflict when, with someone who will fight back. You can't, be in, you can't be in a fight with someone if they refuse to fight you. One person fighting doesn't work. So when conflict comes, will you, will you be shaped by Jesus to the point that you take this third way? See, this is the disruptive teaching of Jesus. This is a description of life in the kingdom. He's giving us practical examples that leave people dumbfounded with what it actually looks like to live the Jesus way. 
Our family loves to go to the movies. We don't go very often because we don't want to take a second mortgage out on our home just to go to the movie theater and get a bucket of popcorn. But we love to go to the movies. And when we go to the movies, we always go early enough to catch the, the previews, the trailers. Anybody else with me on this? We absolutely love to watch the trailer. If you don't go early enough to watch the trailer, next time you're going to the movies, go and watch the trailers and then watch the people. It's, it's absolutely astonishing. Everybody responds and reacts to the movie trailers exactly the same. It's like synchronized swimming, okay? If you've seen this, what people do is as soon as the movie trailer is over, everybody in the movie theater immediately becomes a movie critic. And we're like, yeah, not interested in seeing that one. That one looks terrible. Or, man, that movie looks amazing. We gotta go see that. Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, is casting this vision of the way that Christians should live so that when non-Christians, so that when unbelievers are watching, they would look at our life and either go, yeah, I'm not interested in that. If that's how they act, if that's how they respond, I don't want anything to do with that. If this is how they handle conflict, I'm not interested in that. Or they look at our life and say, man, that is so compelling. That is remarkable that in the face of pressure, in the face of suffering and persecution and difficulty, there's something different about these people that causes them to respond differently. The way that you live your life is a movie trailer for the outside world. And Jesus is giving us all of this coaching in the Sermon on the Mount. For the first 60 to 70 years of the Christian faith, the Romans referred to us not as Christians, but as people of the way. They called Christians people of the way because nobody knew who Jesus was. A lot of the people around in the culture didn't know what the scriptures said. They just knew that there was something radically different and authentic about the way that these Christ followers lived. There's something different about the way that they served others even when they were oppressed. There's something about the way that they stewarded marriage and relationships. There was something different about the way that these people stewarded their money and their finances and sacrificially and generously gave. There's something that people saw about the way that these people selflessly and tirelessly gave of themselves to help their fellow man, even if that person was their enemy. It was so striking that in the first century, it absolutely turned culture upside down. So much so that they referred to Christians as people of the way. Y'all, we've gotta reclaim our identity as people of the way. So that when someone doesn't know what our Bible says, when someone doesn't know who our Jesus is, they can read the pages of our life and understand that there's something different about the way that we live that gives us the opportunity to say it's not something, it's someone who's changed everything about us. And so friends, let's, let's invite Jesus to shape every aspect of our life, our family, our finances, the way that we work to the point where everybody around us says the way that they're doing this is so different and so remarkable that I got to see more about this. Let's pray. Uh, Jesus, we thank you for the way that you've modeled this for us. This isn't just something that you've taught in theory, saying, hey, this might be a good idea. God, this is an invitation that you have for us, that you've modeled for us in Jesus. And so God, give us the courage to make the changes in our life so that we can be shaped by the life and the teaching and the ministry of Jesus. God, may we not walk out of this place unchanged. May we experience what it looks like to be shaped by Jesus. It's in his name we pray, amen.